It's not letting me do the video either. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, there's some of our members who have some very important information to share with us. So we're going to go a little out of order today. But first, I want to welcome everybody to uh, the second meeting of the Cannabis Advisory Committee for the state of California for the year of 2021. It's great to be back together with you, uh, at least virtually. And with that, can I get uh, establishment of quorum? Avis Babuya? Here. Tim Sermat? Here. There he is. Thank you. Matt Clifford? Here. Chair Farrell? Present. Vice Chair Heidelbeck? Here. Eric Harada? Here. Alice Huffman? Kristen Lynch? Here. Kristen Nevado. Here. LeVon Peck. Matt, Matt. Rowan. Keith Stevenson. Here. Present. Uh, thank you. Tamar Todd. Here. Helena Williams. Here. David Woolsey. Here. Ben Wu, Beverly Yu, <laughs> thank you. Quorum is established. Fantastic. So as I said, we have a couple committee members that are crucial to the agenda items today that have other uh, overlapping commitments. And so with that, I'd like to start with agenda item four, discussion and possible action to reject, approve, modify the subcommittee's uh, recommendations on enforcement. Uh, Matt Clifford, uh, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate your accommodating my schedule. I've got a, a really hard stop at 11 o'clock, so appreciate that. So uh, I guess I just, my job here is to report out the um, meeting of the sub, of the advisory, uh, sub, of the, excuse me, the subcommittee on enforcement, which met last week, a week ago today. And there were three substantive items on our agenda that we took up, which were the um, enforcement disciplinary guidelines. And by way of background, um, currently, um, both CDFA and the Bureau of Cannabis Control have disciplinary guidelines that uh, classify the various offenses uh, that, um, you know, can be committed by licensed entities. So this is like uh, numerous provisions of the Business and Professions Code and then the associated regulations that exist underneath that, underneath those. And there's, a, you know, as one can imagine, a myriad of offenses that can be committed, you know, that are, that are possible, you know, things, everything from, you know, the premises, uh, conditions on the premises, track and trace, um, various selling, um, uh, et cetera. And so uh, both those agencies currently have uh, guidelines. Uh, and I don't know if those have been distributed as part of these meeting materials or not, but they were for us. Um, guidelines which classify those um, um, of potential offenses into uh, different tiers of severity from least severe to, you know, to more moderate to, you know, minor, moderate, and severe, basically, based on a number of factors. And so the question uh, on our first agenda item was, um, so with consolidation, um, what input did we want to provide on um, what the new agency, you know, what, what those guidelines should look like and how they should classify offenses, basically. And so for that first agenda item, we went over the guidance in detail of both agencies, uh, the written guidance, and looked at the factors that were involved. Um, BCC in particular has a, a, a list of, um, I think, 12 factors which which are used to consider the, the, the severity of offenses when they are committed. And then they have, again, have the classification of the various um, different uh, kinds of offenses into moderate uh, mild, moderate, and severe. And so the, the factors that are considered are all the things that one might, ex a number of things one might expect, um, prior disciplinary record, mitigating evidence, um, uh, nature and severity of the act, you know, things, uh, potential harm to the public, things like that. Um, and so bottom line on our first, on our first agenda item about what to say about what the combined agency should adopt, we did not take action on that. And our reasoning was, that um, we didn't have a whole lot of background information. There was not, as far as we could tell, a, a great deal of history with um, the current policies in the two agencies. And we certainly didn't have uh, much experience to draw on. And we, from public comment, did not 
um, hear a whole lot of dissatisfaction for how the, the, these have been applied to date uh, to the extent that they have. And it was probably quite clear that the agencies are still, and, and the public and, and the regulated community are still in something of a learning phase regarding these items. And so we didn't feel action was appropriate this time based on the current record, but it's a, it's an item we'd like to continue to keep on the radar and, and agendize for future meetings as experience moves forward. Our second agenda item was relate was similar, but a little bit different, our second and third. And this is uh, the back of recommendations related to how regulatory and statutory violations by licensees should be prioritized for action so that of the committee, of the uh, offenses that are committed, which ones, you know, or, or, or that could be investigated, what should the priority of the agencies be about which violations to, to move forward with for licensed entities? And here we did have a motion, and I, I'm, I apologize, I'm a little unclear, but I assume we have the text of the motion um, from the report. We, we did a, pass a motion for consideration by this committee, naming a few factors that we think should be considered by the consolidated agency. When it Matt, has, we when do it's... have the two motions that the enforcement subcommittee made. It is a meeting material. Um, if you don't okay. have that available, I can read the motions. I would appreciate that. I'm sorry, I'm um, sort of digging through my, trying to pull up the agenda. I don't know, so I don't have that in front of me right now. But if we could, for agenda item three for the enforcement subcommittee, I think it's a recommendation to this committee about um, what um, prioritiz prioritization criteria that the new agency should consider in disciplinary actions. And we should probably read that now. Okay. Uh, the motion was to recommend the licensing authority prioritize for disciplinary action violations that directly impact public health or environmental degradation, specifically focus on sales to minors, sales and distribution of contaminated or unsafe products, and egregious environmental damage. So these are the factors that the committee discussed that felt should rise to the top and be part of any disciplinary action for the combined agency and it's not procedurally at this point I, I guess i'd like to get this in front of the full committee for their consideration and possible adoption is, is that a motion from me or how should we, how should we proceed mr chair do you have yeah. a <clears throat> excuse me yes that that's how it would go make a recommendation from your committee that the the full committee uh, consider your recommendation and then we can have a discussion open it up to public comment and then take a vote Okay, so as the subcommittee chair, I would move that the I, I would move that the uh, full committee adopt this motion, uh, this recommendation from the subcommittee. So moved. So any discussion for our committee members? I think we need a second. Yeah. This committee member uh, Cermak and I would second that motion. Thank you, committee member Cermak. So we have a motion and a second. Um, would the committee consider some discussion on that motion? Anybody have any questions or comments? Hearing none or seeing no hands raised, uh, can we open it up for public comment? We can always go back to committee members once we've gotten some public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference and we'll give you a moment. All right, we have an individual uh, by the name of Eddie Franco that would like to make a comment. And uh, please note that uh, the comments are limited to one minute. I will give you a 30 second warning. So if you can keep it to one minute. And Eddie, you have been unmuted. Hi, panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, Eddie Franco, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Manager with the California Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, this public comment will be very brief. We support the recommendations made by the Enforcement Subcommittee. Thank you so much. All right, our next request for public comment is from Erica Leary. And Erica, again, you'll have one minute. Erica, you have been unmuted. Uh, thank you, uh, committee members. My name is Erica Leary. I'm the program manager for the North Coastal Prevention Coalition in North San Diego County. And I would just like to comment my support for prioritizing preventing sales to minors as part of your enforcement actions. 
and would recommend an ongoing and um, process for doing so, similar to what's done for preventing alcohol sales to minors and tobacco sales to minors. Uh, so there's consistent uh, noticed enforcement and consequences to hold retailers um, as well as the illicit market accountable. Also a focus on delivery operators. 30 Thank you. seconds. Oh. All right, our next request for public comment is from William Perno. William, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, William, you've been unmuted. Thank you. I'm William Perno, a prevention specialist with the Central Region Prevention Coalition in San Diego, focusing on alcohol and other drug prevention for youth. And I also support the uh, recommendations from the Enforcement Committee uh, for these um, items and want to specifically thank them for uh, prioritizing um, enforcement for sales to minors by both licensed and unlicensed uh, businesses and vehicle deliveries. And that's something that um, we would like to see a future report from the committee on what has been done since legalization on January 1st, 2018 for uh, these type of enforcement actions for the regulated market and the unregulated 30 seconds from the BCC. This is very important information to note and other states are tracking this. They are doing uh, hundreds of these types of operations uh, per year. And we'd like to see what the BCC has done uh, since 2018, January 1st, when sales, uh, recreational sales began. Thank you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Leticia Robles. Leticia, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. Again, you'll have one minute with a 30 second warning. All right, Leticia, you've been unmuted. This is a moderator and Leticia, if you're talking, we can't hear you. All right, we're going to mute you and go on to the next person. We'll come back to you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Paul and Susan Hansberry Tibben. Hold on, and I will let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Paul and Susan, you've been unmuted. Hi, this is Paul Hansberry, lovingly and legally. Uh, while I generally support the recommendation, I think that it might be good for the subcommittee to have. Um, at his disposal, someone who's a bit more familiar with the operations of BCC uh, or of the Bureau, um, there was a lot of questions and, and no answers to things such as um, how many deputies are available for, you know, from the Bureau? What kind of resources do they have? They weren't able to answer that, so they couldn't give recommendations that they wanted to give based on the lack of information. But um, as far as this motion, I generally uh, support it. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. And our next request for public comment is from Thomas Caristo. Thomas, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Thomas, you've been unmuted. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Uh, appreciate the invite. Uh, I'm a little new to this, so I do apologize, but I was just wondering um, if maybe one of y'all could provide any more definition or clarification on what an egregious uh, environmental damage would constitute. Um, otherwise, everything sounds good. And again, thank you. All right, our next request from for public comment is from Wade Laughter. So Wade, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Wade, you've been unmuted. Uh, thank you, committee. Uh, I wanna thank the entire committee for uh, your service to this industry and trying to sort out the issues that we face. Enforcement is certainly a huge issue. And um, I find that the, uh, the recommendations of the subcommittee on enforcement are a, a great start in understanding the complexities of the system and how to make it in compliance system from top to bottom. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Wade Lack. Thank you. And our next request for public comment is from Carol Green. Carol, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Carol, you've been unmuted. 
Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Carol Green. I'm a mother of um, three young adult children and wanted to really um, emphasize your um, focus on enforcement and protecting our minors. I think this is um, very important and it is the promise that um, everyone was given when this um, market was uh, supposedly regulated and it hasn't um, happened yet. So I'm looking forward to the enforcement that you'll mm -hmm. put in place. Hey, moderator, before we move to the next panelist, let me just make a note. Uh, the reason most of us have our cameras off is that we have a bandwidth issue because of the many, many, many people using these networks. So unless you are on and speaking, you can leave your camera off, but we've enabled it so that those speaking can turn on their, their camera. So if you'd be so kind as to stop your video for now, if you're not speaking, that way we're ensured to have a sufficient bandwidth for other um, other people. Thanks. Kristen, your video is on. Never all. And this is the moderator. That is the end of our request for public comment. We have a second request for an ad the same agenda item, which we don't allow, so I'm ignoring that one. So we are done with public comment. Mr. Hey, Brittany, Chair, if, Russia, your camera is on. Brittany, if it happens to be um, uh, Paul or Susan, that's fine. you, they share a video. Okay. Um, so, would you like me to go ahead and close the question and answer panel? Please do. Okay. It's been closed. So, uh, committee members, do we have any uh, questions or discussions? And if not, would one of you entertain making a motion to accept the recommendations of the subcommittee? Ooh, I think we have that already, right? Uh, Matt, no, the recommendation was for us to hear it. Now we have to have a recommendation, oh. do we not? I thought I thought the recommendation was to, to adopt this. So I thought oh. that's what we, yeah, I think I can, oh, I can say the step. No. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. Sorry about that. So, um, seeing no other comments, uh, the, the clerk will call roll. Thank you. So the motion is to accept the enforcement recommendation and the recommendation is that licensing authorities prioritize for disciplinary action violations that directly impact public health or invite environmental degradation, specifically focus on sales to minors sales and distribution of contaminated and unsafe products and egregious environmental damage. Avis Babulian? Aye. Tim and Sir Matt? Aye. Matt Clifford? Aye. Jeff Barrow? Aye. Kristen Heidelbach? Aye. Eric Harada? Aye. Um, Kristen Lynch? Aye. Kristen Nevidal? Aye. Keith Stevenson? Aye. Tamar Todd? Aye. Alina Williams? Aye. David Woolsey? Aye. Ben Wu? Aye. Beverly Yu? Aye. Motion passes. Very good. Okay. Thank this you. Is mem member Clifford yeah, was... again. Should I, should I resume, Jeff? Yes, that's what I was going to say. Please resume with your other agenda item. Okay, thanks. So our final agenda item, we have our second recommendation, um, is a little is, is very similar but a little bit different. The last one dealt with uh, um, factors for prioritizing offenses by um, by licensed entities, and this final one deals with uh, factors for prioritizing um, offenses. Uh, committed by unlicensed entities. So we're talking about, you know, illegal operators basically here. And I'll, I'll go ahead, I've, I've managed to find the reading material, so I'll go ahead and read our recommendation. Uh, we adopt the recommendation, recommend that the licensing authority focus enforcement efforts in, jurisdic in jurisdictions that allow licensed commercial cannabis operators over jurisdictions that do not, so that licensed operators can thrive. Her name's Trish. Oops, I think someone needs to go on mute. Uh, sorry, I'll start over. Recommend that the licensing authority focus enforcement efforts in jurisdictions that allow licensed commercial cannabis operators over jurisdictions that do not, 
so that licensed operators can thrive. Recommend that the licensing authority prioritize enforcement efforts against unlicensed businesses that are selling to minors, selling contaminated projects, or that cause egregious environmental harm. And at this time, I would move, Mr. Chairman, that the uh, full committee adopt this recommendation as well. This is committee member Cermak. I would second that motion. Uh, having a motion and a second, can uh, we open this up to uh, discussion from the committee? And I'd be happy to address any questions from members of the committee. Seeing no questions. I'm sorry, this is Tim's. Yes, Dr. Cermak. Dr. Cermak, I'm recognizing you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to uh, congratulate the Enforcement Committee for uh, returning a balance to the original Prop 64, which had two equal um, goals there. One is to create the, the industry and uh, in a regulated way, and the second is to protect the public health. And I've, I've uh, supported uh, the Public Health Institute and some other uh, people who have written Governor uh, Newsom saying that when we consolidate, it would be useful to um, have each of those goals uh, more equally represented than what has happened uh, so far with the, with the BCC and the other regulatory agencies and the advisory committee. Um, I think this is returning a balance which is really healthy for both the state and the industry. And it provides this, this third uh, item that you're mentioning here, I think provides uh, an excellent way of being able to direct enforcement towards the unlicensed uh, entities in a way that the public in particular would be really willing to support because when it's um, under the aegis of the public health uh, um, violations, uh, I, I think the public will be much more likely to uh, support whatever is characterized as a crackdown on the unlicensed uh, industry. So I, I thoroughly support this and I think it's bringing some, some uh, needed balance back into our efforts here. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Clifford. Oh, excuse me, Dr. Cermak, I've been mixing you up today. Uh, <laughs> any other comments from, there you go. Yeah, you, know. you did this with surgical precision, brother. Uh, with that, any other committee members have comments? Seeing none, let's open the public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will go ahead and open up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference and we'll give you a moment. All right, we have William Pernell who would like to make a comment. William, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. And William, you have been unmuted. Thank you. I'm William Perno, and um, my comment is regarding prioritizing the enforcement for areas that already have a licensed marketplace. Um, Proposition 64 gives the community a choice as to whether or not they want to have sales in their area. And I think by um, prioritizing it in areas that only have allowed a regulated market, sets up an inequitable um, system, and it rewards uh, communities that have allowed sales and penalizes from lack of prioritizing enforcement those that have not. So uh, I encourage all enforcement efforts against the unregulated market, but I think this um, puts, seconds. I think this particular motion, and I understand uh, the reasons why it was uh, made, but I think it, it penalizes communities that have not chosen to allow uh, sales in their area. And I think we need to look for areas uh, for things that will be um, equal across the playing field uh, for enforcement there. And I hope that the uh, state can find some funding to do that. Thank you. All right, our next 
request for public comment is from Eddie Franco. Eddie, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Eddie, you've been unmuted. Thank you, panelists and committee members. Eddie Franco, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Manager of, uh, with the California Cannabis Industry Association. Again, want to echo support uh, for these recommendations, particularly um, want to thank the committee, the subcommittee and, and support the piece um, that is prioritizing enforcement in jurisdictions that do allow commercial cannabis operations. Um, by far, the biggest competitor to the legal cannabis op, uh, industry is the illicit cannabis market. Moreover, uh, the best tool to enforce against illicit cannabis operations are a strong legal uh, and supported uh, legal industry. Therefore, really um, think again the thoughtfulness and, um, and the recommendation made by that subcommittee um, and generally support this recommendation. Thank you so much. All right, our next request for public comment is from, excuse me, Paul and Susan. So, Paul and Susan, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Paul and Susan, you've been unmuted. Hi, thank you. This is Paul Hansberry, lovingly and legally. Um, totally support this recommendation. Uh, Prop 64 was very specific in that no tax monies were to be spent on jurisdictions that did not allow cannabis operations. Um, and so this is in line with Prop 64 and not really being unfair. The unlicensed people um, are a law enforcement issue, not a code enforcement or, or a regulatory thing. And just for the record, I want to clarify that the, Prop 64 asked the regulators to regulate an existing industry, not create a new industry which is what they seem to have done. And that's the perception is that the Prop 64 was for them to create a new industry. And that's not the case. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. All right, the next request for public comment is from Erica Leary. Erica, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Erica, you've been unmuted. Uh, thank you, committee members. I. Um, understand the position of Prop 64 directing funds where licensed businesses are allowed. However, I would like to ask the committee to consider some um, additional con thoughts to make sure that that doesn't just create more problems by directing the illicit market to other jurisdictions. Uh, part of the reasons we're hearing why jurisdictions opt not to allow businesses yet is because of the weak regulatory and enforcement um, process that has yes, yet to be established. So um, I think if there's an area known to have high illicit seconds. market, whether or not there's regulated industry there, it should be a statewide um, goal to eliminate the illicit market wherever it's thriving not just based on where licenses are permitted. Thank you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Kelly McCormick. Kelly, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Kelly, you've been unmuted. Thank you, this is Kelly McCormick, and I would just like to um, reiterate the comments made by the previous speaker. I completely agree that um, both the regulated market and the illicit market need to receive attention. And um, in an especially minor decoy operations, those are so necessary. We know with alcohol that, um, you know, the, the underage sales and deliveries have been taking place. And so it's safe to assume that the same thing is happening with marijuana. And so as a parent and a youth advocate, I beg you to, 30 seconds. Uh, to do minor decoy operations and have a criteria for enforcement and for um, remediation. Thank you very much. All right, our next request for public comment is from Sarah Armstrong. Sarah, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. And Sarah, you've been unmuted. I am Sarah Armstrong, Director of Industry Affairs for Americans for Safe Access and Policy Chair for the Southern California Coalition. It's my understanding that statutorily, unless you allow licensing, you are not 
uh, eligible for money from the government for enforcement. So that is something that will have to be fixed if you want enforcement in areas which don't offer uh, licensure. When you fail to enforce in licensed areas against illegal entities, you create a terrible situation for social equity because they go into a marketplace contaminated with all these illegal sales. Seconds. And of course, when you fail to enforce all those people who are line workers and could be eligible for union jobs in a licensed facility lose that opportunity. For these reasons, both organizations support the idea of uh, enforcing in the areas that have uh, licensed their participants, and we thank you for your time. All right, the next request for comment is from Carol Green. Carol, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Carol, you have been unmuted. Thank you. Um, as a um, just a regular old uh, citizen who doesn't have any um, uh, stake in this business at all, I would like to say that um, enforcement needs to come across all levels. Uh, the kids, uh, people don't know if it's licensed or permitted or not. And um, it's our responsibility as uh, officials to make sure that we're protecting the public. So enforcement needs to happen across the board. All right, and that is the end of request for public comment. Mr. Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? I see one hand up in the... Okay. Thank you. Let me check. Just scrolling through our attendees. Okay, I see Natasha. Natasha, you've been unmuted. Thank you. And Natasha Sokolowski here. I would just like to thank you all and share support for all efforts made and encouragement of protecting our youth. And uh, deciphering that, you know, between what is actually medicinal use versus the recreational use. So thank you. All right, this is a moderator. And just a reminder to lower your hand, you simply click on the hand icon a second time and that will lower that. Uh, at this time, I do not see further requests. Oh, I see Judith with her hand up. So uh, let me unmute Judith. Judith, you've been unmuted. Good morning. I would like to share my concept of living in a small city in a large county, and there are 18 cities in our county. Half of us have permitted marijuana businesses, half of us don't. Those boundaries are very fluid. And I think since I live in a city where we do not have permitted marijuana businesses, we feel discriminated against. Speaking of inequity, that's a perfect example. I think cities, whether they're unpermitted or permitted marijuana businesses, we need to have access to the same enforcement opportunity so that we can protect all our citizens, particularly in young people. Thank you. All right, so I believe now we have uh, taking care of all requests for public comment. Again, um, public attendees, if you could please click the hand icon a, a second time and that will lower your hand. That's not something we can do for you. So you need to do that yourself by just clicking on that hand icon a second time. And Mr. Chair, would you like me to go ahead and close the Q&A panel? Please do. And I'd, I'd like to close again that there is a process by which people can participate. It's the preferred way. So if you could just type in that panel at the bottom when it's open that you would like to ask a question, we'll put you in order so that way you aren't missed. Um, the larger the part, the group um, listening in, the harder it is for us to follow hands. So uh, with that, um, I will take a, any comments from the committee based upon the public comment or um, if I see none, we can take the roll. Mr. Chair, this is Member Clifford again. Quick, quick clarification, and I probably should have been more clear about this at, at the start. But just as far as what this recommendation applies to, and we're talking about 
Um, of, of course, there's many law enforcement agencies out there that can enforce against the illegal operators. You know, there's local police, you know, police forces, sheriffs, et cetera, local law enforcement. There's Department of Fish and Wildlife in, against cultivators, et cetera, and um, other agencies as well. And what this covers is how the new bureau will, will spend its relatively limited resources that it has available to, to, to act against unlicensed operators. Since most of the attention of the agency, of course, will be on licensed operators. And we were advised at the meeting that that consists of a relatively small number of peace officers that are currently are under CDFA, but will be part of the, you know, the new bureau. And I just wanted to clarify that because I think, you know, that that's just important context when we talk about, it's really a relatively small, but potentially important part of the enforcement piece. Just wanted to mention that. That's all. Yes. Thank you, committee member Clifford, Chair Clifford. You did a fabulous job and we appreciate you um, letting the public know that because that is very accurate. So, uh, committee member Babulian, I, your hand is raised. Right yes, one of the things I was going to add is that if enforcement is going to be effective, it has to be focused and it has to start somewhere. That somewhere should be, and needs to be the areas where it is permitted and then expand out from there. Um, if you were to target the whole state and have it equally distributed, um, at least the prioritization of enforcement efforts, we're going to be exactly where we've been for the past three years. Thank you very much for those comments. And yes, you know, the the licensing fees uh, go to cover enforcement against the illegal market. And um, those fees get strained if we go outside of the market that's legally operating. So um, a city wants some assistance, they should probably look at a system in which they allow licensing and then that would afford them the resources to go after the illegal market that targets, you know, individuals maybe not of age and provides products that may not be properly tested to the to the market endangering the consumer so with that um i'll call the roll our role is being called on the motion that licensing authorities focus enforcement efforts in jurisdictions that allow licensed commercial cannabis operators over jurisdictions that do not so that licensed operators can thrive Recommend that the licensing authority prioritize enforcement efforts against unlicensed businesses that are selling to minors, selling contaminated products, or that cause egregious environmental harm. Uh, Avis Babouillon? Aye. Tim Sermet? Aye. Matt Clifford? Aye. Chair Farrow? Aye. Aye. Vice Chair Heidelbach? Aye. Eric Harada? Aye. Uh, Kristen Lynch? Aye. Kristen Nevidal? Aye. Keith Stevenson? Aye. Tamar Todd? Aye. Helena Williams? Aye. David Woolsey? Aye. Ben Wu? Aye. Beverly Yu? Aye. Motion passes. And uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have at this time. Well, thank you for your good work. We made it under the wire. I'd like to say that since you referenced that you'd like to keep agenda item one from your subcommittee live so we can reconsider it when more data comes in, um, you know, permitting that the committee wishes to stay, that we will keep that committee standing until such time the issue provides us enough data that you can tackle that agenda item. So thank you again for all your work. Good work, um, and we'll move on. So um, I didn't really get to make much comment at the beginning, but I did want to um, recognize uh, today is the George Floyd Day, and I imagine there's going to be some um, questions about our subcommittee on diversity and equity, and I will let you know that between now and the next meeting, that committee will be scheduled. We just didn't have sufficient time to get that committee on the agenda for this meeting. So uh, that committee has been uh, selected. Uh, the vice chair of the committee did a fabulous job in picking all of our chairs and we look forward to getting those reports at the next committee meeting. So um, with that, we'll move on to agenda item number three because also that committee chair, subcommittee chair has some challenges with her availability later. So with that, um, Committee member Chair Nevidal, please um, take over the role. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much. This is um, Committee Member Nevidal, and I'm going to report back on the subcommittee on license types. 
Um, we did hear multiple items um, during our subcommittee proceedings, which was um, a week ago last Monday. Um, so um, the first item we heard and discussed was creation of a cottage legacy license type. Um, while the subcommittee did not take action on this, well, we didn't pass a recommendation on this. We did have a motion on this item. Um, there was um, very broad discussion, both amongst committee members and with the public on this topic. Um, and that discussion ranged from the development of a cottage type micro business. Um, and also we heard significant public comment about the um, need for um, opportunities such as consumer direct sales um, and farmers markets, as well as um, the ability for small cultivators to um, move their genetics into the legal supply chain. Um, with that said, we did put forward or bring forward um, a motion recommending that the licensing authority um, create a cottage type license that allows for um, consumer direct sales and cultivators to move their um, genetics into the legal supply chain and that that license type have some sort of a scale um, capping mechanism associated with it. Um, after robust discussion on that license or that proposal, um, the uh, Subcommittee did take a vote and that vote split on the middle um, with a 2 2, which meant that the recommendation itself did fail. Um, and there were no further motions um, in relationship to this item. Um, the next item that we discussed was in reference to CEQA regulations. Um, after reading the provided material from the licensing authorities, which included the regulations regarding CEQA. Um, into the record. I also um, read into the record the um, language from um, Proposition 64 in relationship to CEQA. Um, we had much robust discussion and did bring forward a recommendation, um, which I'll go ahead and read, and then we'll see if we can get a motion to move the recommendation um, before the entire subcommittee today. So the recommendation that the subcommittee passed and brings forward for the committee's consideration reads, recommend that the licensing authority consider uncoupling the project specific CEQA analysis from annual licenses and instead provide guidance to the local jurisdictions to ensure that applicants meet CEQA compliance during the local permitting process. Um, before we go to um, the full committee member, uh, the full body of the committee for discussion, I just wanted to note that um, a portion of the robust discussion really um, focused around the challenges of transitioning a provisional to an annual. Um, currently, under statute and state regulations, all annual license types are subject to project specific CEQA analysis. Um, and so, in order for an applicant to meet those CEQA requirements, um, basically um, must be subject to a discretionary permit at the local level, um, which is what includes the project specific CEQA analysis is that discretionary action taken by the local jurisdiction. Um, when um, applicants are not subject to that project specific analysis at the local level, um, it creates a whole series of challenges for that applicant to meet the requirements of an annual license. Um, and then additionally, because the annual licenses themselves require project specific CEQA analysis, um, there is pretty extensive review conducted at the state level of the project specific analysis that has been conducted at the local level should that applicant have been subject to um, a discretionary permit locally. Um, so essentially um, the requirement of project specific analysis and CEQA um, analysis at the annual license type has um, likely been one of the um, main slowing factors for processing um, provisionals into annuals. Um, it also um, has posed some significant um, expense challenges or cost challenges to the 
on the applicants themselves. So with that said, we, we did make a recommendation um, and I just want to pause and see if there is discussion to be had amongst the committee members or perhaps if the committee members would like me to read the recommendation one more time since I read it in the middle of the discussion and or that information I brought forward. So I'm um, pausing to see if there are any committee members who would like to have discussion. Yes, member Clifford, please. You have the floor. Oh, good. I found the hand raise function. Thank you. Yeah, if I would. Could you read that again, please? Thank you. I'll take it back. I, I do need to go, but I want to stick around a little bit for this agenda item, um, at least for the start of the discussion. Yes, absolutely. So rereading the recommendation um, that was passed by the subcommittee. The subcommittee recommends that the licensing authority consider uncoupling the project specific CEQA analysis from annual licenses and instead provide guidance to local jurisdictions to ensure that applicants meet CEQA compliance during the local permitting process. Chief Thank Chief you. Minister. Thank you. So my understanding on this, and that, that sounds reasonable, I, I assumed that the, the bottleneck here with, with the local licensing process is, is that local jurisdictions need to do programmatic CEQA documents, right, to, to have this in place so that they can do that review programmatically and not on an, a project specific basis, right? Is, is that the ultimate solution? And my understanding is a lot of local jurisdictions are behind the curve on doing that. Well, currently as the um, statute and the regulations are set up, even if a local jurisdiction conducts an initial study and provides the subsequent CEQA documentation to cover their um, ordinance that they stand up, the applicant um, themselves are still subject to project specific CEQA analysis. Um, in order to qualify for an annual license. So the um, local jurisdictions initial study and CEQA um, evaluation and documentation of their ordinance does not qualify a local or an applicant for an annual license. Only project specific CEQA analysis will qualify um, an applicant for an annual license. There is no way for a local jurisdiction to issue a ministerial permit or anything less than a discretionary, less than a discretionary permit if that applicant will qualify for an annual license. So in every case, we have to do an individual CEQA determination on, on, on every cannabis license under correct. the current scheme? That is Thanks. correct, which is why we made the recommendation. That doesn't, okay, thank you. Um, and then um, any other committee members have questions um, regarding this item? Okay, well, with that said, I think um, I see no um, hands. I'm gonna go ahead and um, make a motion that the, um, the Cannabis Advisory Committee um, adopt the recommendation that the licensing authority consider uncoupling the project specific CEQA analysis, CEQA analysis from annual licenses and instead provide guidance to the local jurisdictions to ensure that applicants meet CEQA compliance during the local permitting process. We have a second to the motion. Um, yes, I see members, your hands raised. Member Boboyan, please. Uh, the save us all second. Thank you, Member Boboyan. Um, any further comment on the motion before we go to public comment? Oh, um, Member Sermat, please. I see your hand raised. And Member Sarmak, I think you are still muted. Um, I cannot hear you. Can we get some assistance with unmuting um, Dr. Sarmak's um, microphone, please? Thank you. Yes, this is a moderator and I'm trying to do so and it is resisting me. I apologize. Usually I'm able to manually unmute people, but it is not allowing me to do so. Um, why don't we? 
Dr. Cermak, can you try tapping your space bar on the laptop or desktop that you're using to see if that unlocks your microphone? So um, maybe we could get um, someone to um, check in with member Cermak and in the meantime, um, go to member Wu. Um, Hi, um, yeah, let me uh, jump in here while we're waiting for uh, Dr. Cermak. Um, I'm just gonna play devil's advocate and, and ask, you know, how do you allay the fear, right? When I hear that you, you say that we can, every specific project can avoid you know, CEQA, and personally, uh, I, I understand the challenges of CEQA, so I'm not arguing that, but how do you lay the fear that, you know, by having everyone avoid a project-specific CEQA analysis that, you know, something doesn't go off the rails? Yeah, I think that that's a great question, and I'm, I'm happy to clarify that. Um, this recommendation in itself would not allow or create an exemption that would allow every project to avoid CEQA analysis. Um, basically, what this would do would be um, provide a local control component to ensuring that CEQA regulations are indeed met. So, um, barring a legislative exemption, um, there's no way for um, all cannabis operations to um, um, skip a CEQA analysis. So. Um, I think the, 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 let's see, how do we say this in a way that makes sense? Um, I think the, the kind of loosest version of CEQA that we could possibly see under uh, uncoupling of the project specific um, CEQA components from the annual license would be um, allowing local jurisdictions to essentially treat widgets like widgets. So, for example, if a local jurisdiction were to treat um, retail sales as a commercial retail activity and utilize their general plan for commercial retail activities to appropriately zone, right, um, the um, commercial retail activity, then it's possible that the retail cannabis retail shop would be allowed a ministerial permit. Now, um, in standing up the rule or regulation to allow for commercial cannabis retail sales, that rule or regulation would be subject to CEQA analysis and may create additional performance standards that would have to be folded into the ordinance in order for a commercial retail sales facility to be allowed a ministerial permit within zoning already identified by the local jurisdiction's general plan for such commercial activities. Now, one more thing I think it's important to note is that all general plans are accompanied by an environmental impact report, which is what helps the local jurisdiction identify the appropriate um, areas in their political boundaries that are um, feasible for commercial retail sales and what sort of standards should go on to the retail activity, right? Do they have to have parking considerations? Do they have to have sidewalks? Do they need to be AB a compliance? What should their signs look like? So on and so forth. Um, within that parameter or that description of, you know, utilizing at the kind of most minimum standards for CEQA, a general plan component for establishing um, a zoning table or um, appropriate land use specifications for cannabis activities. Um, if the retail example that we're using decided to build their own facility on a brand new lot, right? it is highly likely that the expanded development of building a new store in a new location, that that would elevate that um, operation from an activity to a project and require CEQA analysis. Um, so I, I hope that that example um, helps um, with your question, Member Wu. 
um, I'm happy to have more discussion and provide more information as I'm sure legal um, would be willing to as well. So I'm going to pass it back to you and mute my microphone for a moment. Thank you. No, that, that answers my question. It's a complicated one, but I, I think you explained it well for me at least. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Member Cermak, I'm just coming back to you. I see you lowered your hand, but I just wanted to see if um, you still wanted to make a comment or ask a question, and you have been unmuted. Yes, are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank, thank you. I've been on and off a couple times since I tried earlier. Um, this may have been answered, but I'm just curious as to uh, who uh, currently determines that a CEQA analysis is uh, sufficient. Um, and in this uncoupling and turning it over to the, uh, the need for it to be done by the time of the local license, is anyone different? Is the, is, are the local authorities then the ones that are now having to determine whether or not the CEQA analysis is sufficient and, um, and are they, are they capable of doing that? Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a great question and I'll, I'll take a crack at this. This is member of it all again. So, um, currently under any sort of discretionary permit process that occurs at the local level, um, the locals, um, receive the local jurisdiction receives the complete application. That complete application is referred out to a multitude of local and state agencies for review. Those agencies have the ability to make suggestions in the form of referrals um, back to the local jurisdiction. Um, and then the local jurisdiction works with the applicant to ensure that um, the recommendations are incorporated into that project, um, that project's description and um, operations plans. Um, once all of the referral process and the information from the other agencies is been um, somewhat negotiated, I think, so to speak, and then adopted as appropriate or necessary, um, the application um, then would go forward to a public hearing either with a zoning administrator or the planning commission for that local jurisdiction. Um, once the application is um, approved, Right by the zoning administrator and or the um, planning commission for that local jurisdiction, um, the CEQA determination, either a notice of exemption or a notice of determination is filed. That notice is then posted um, on the Office of Planning and Research, the state's Office of Planning and Research website, where the public and additional agencies have time to review that and then additionally provide input on that determination. Um, this is um, common for all types of discretionary permits at the local level. Um, currently, in order to achieve an annual license, this discretionary process is frankly the easiest route to getting to an annual license because as I mentioned earlier, if the applicant is not subject to the discretionary permit process at the local level, um, they do not have a notice of exemption or determination to bring forward to the state to qualify them for annual licensure. Um, and the state um, currently, um, in as far as I am aware, has not been taking on the project specific CEQA analysis component for applicants and doing the application process that I just mentioned with the referrals to other agencies. So. Um, this really is best handled at the local level, in, in my opinion, um, and is commonly how CEQA projects are handled when we're talking about anything from housing developments to strip mining to um, um, the development of chemical plants, say. Um, so um, I, I hope that that answers your question, Member Cermak, but I will um, pass the floor back over to you to see if you have additional questions or comments on this item before we move on. Uh, th that sounds, that's the information I needed. So thank you very much for the answer. Uh, you are welcome. Thank you so much. And um, uh, Member Woolsey, I saw your hand was up. It's now lowered. Um, did you have a comment as well before we proceed? I believe my question was answered. If, if given the retail scenario that you mentioned um, earlier, if this recommendation were adopted by the committee and then ultimately adopted by 
the licensing authorities, um, it wouldn't necessarily require that site-specific CEQA that's required, that you're saying is required now, but it would allow those jurisdictions if they do that more general type of CEQA for that zoning um, to qualify for the state annual license. Is that correct? I think it is unclear at this time because what the recommendation says is that the state should provide guidance to the local jurisdictions to ensure that CEQA guide or CEQA regulations are followed. Um, and so the state may provide guidance under this recommendation that requires all local permits to be discretionary. They may provide guidance that suggests that they could um, provide CEQA or initial study and CEQA documentation of their ordinance and then um, tuck the activity into their general plan. I think, and, and so, you know, the, the general plan component is really probably the area where we could get into local jurisdictions being allowed to issue ministerial permits, but the recommendation itself is, is asking the state to um, uncouple the project specific analysis attached to the annual license and instead provide guidance to local jurisdictions so that they can best manage CEQA compliance. Um, so, Passing Got you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, any additional conversation questions um, to be had um, by committee members before we go to public comment? Okay. Seeing no hands and seeing no microphones unmuted, um, we do have a motion on the floor, and um, I would like to go to public comment, if we may, on that motion, please. Thank you very much. This is the moderator and I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. All right, we have Eddie Franco that would like to make a comment. Eddie, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. And just a reminder, you will have a minute to speak and you'll have a 30 second warning. Thank you, moderator. Sorry about that. Um, Eddie, you've been unmuted. <laughs> thank, thank you, moderator. Eddie Franco with the uh, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Manager with the California Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, strongly, strongly supporting the recommendation and motion made by the subcommittee um, to uncouple the project specific CEQA analysis from annual licensure. Again, 83% of the legal cannabis industry thereabouts uh, operates on provisional licenses right now. A major factor is specifically because of that project specific CEQA analysis folks uh, currently have to go through for their annual licensure. Um, if this goes unaddressed, these thousands of licenses, um, it will take decades at least to fully transition these into annual licenses if this uh, current project specific process remains in place. So again, strongly support the recommendation also, we'll quickly say, although there were motions made and the recommendations did not pass, we do support um, what was discussed by the subcommittee last week in establishing a pathway for small cannabis businesses to offer direct to consumer sales. Uh, we also support allowing genetic transfers uh, by cultivators in the in the system. So thank you so much. And um, again, support very much. All right, our next request for public comment is from Paul and Susan. And Paul and Susan, I'll let you know when you have been unmuted. All right, you've been unmuted. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Farrell, committee members, Susan Tibbon, lovingly and legally. We support the motion. However, would it be possible for the CAC to work more closely and accurately with the BCC to make sure that the next CAC meeting, committee members and stakeholders could actually address a cottage legacy type license? It's, it's really disappointing and frustrating that five years after the passage of 64, we're still shutting out the legacy home farmers who built the newly legalized industry. Um, it's feeling like regulatory agencies would rather just see us fade away by either attrition or interdiction rather than giving our small operators a place in the cannabis farming heritage that we built. 30 seconds. Thanks very much. 
And it looks like we have a comment from Paul as well. Yes, hi, this is Paul Hansbury. Uh, it's my understanding that the agenda for the subcommittee was put together by the Bureau, by the licensing authority and not by the chair of the subcommittee and therefore micro businesses were not as, uh, specifically addressed, um, which was unfortunate. But um, regarding this motion, I think that uh, I would like to add, if it were at all possible, to direct to ask the uh, licensing authority for when they submit their guidance that they don't just copy and paste a copy of the CEQA um, ordinance or the, of the CEQA um, um, document um, that they give the, that they give the local uh, authority the ability, the authority to use common sense. For instance, an in air quality, if I'm cultivating and I'm in a known asbestos, naturally occurring asbestos area, in order for air quality to, for it to be applicable, I have to uh, be disturbing one acre of soil or grading one mile of road. If I'm not doing that, then just NA should be uh, allowed rather than um, uh, sending it off to the air quality management company and therefore streamlining the All right, our next request for public comment is from Hannah Nelson. Hannah, I'll let you know when you have been unmuted and you'll have a minute with a 30 second warning. Hannah, you've been unmuted. Thank you very much. My name is Hannah Nelson. I'm an advisor to the Origins Councils and one of the authors of the materials that we submitted to the CAC. Uh, we are strongly support decoupling and in fact recommended that in our report prepared numerous months ago. But we would like to caution that uh, having local jurisdictions determine or uh, go through the full sequel process and shoulder that burden on a site specific basis would be quite onerous. And we encourage the committee to look at our report and the recommendations for bioregional reports and seconds. model ordinances. We very much appreciate attacking the CEQA and annual licensing issue and look forward to productive further meetings. Thank you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Sarah Armstrong. Sarah, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Sarah, you've been unmuted. Sarah Armstrong speaking in her capacity as policy chair for the Southern California Coalition. We'd like to thank Ms. Nadal and the committee, her committee, for some very good work on a very difficult subject. We support this motion. Uh, and it would appear the state of California does too, because in the coming budget, they are proposing a lot of money to help local jurisdictions get their CEQA work done. CEQA needs to be a local event because the decisions made affect the people who live in that region and there is no reason for a second from any other entity once that decision has been made. Once seconds. again, we'd like to thank Ms. Sandoval and her committee and we stand in strong support of this motion. Thank you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Wade Lapter. Wade, you've been unmuted. Uh, yes, uh, Wade Laughter with House of Harlequin. Uh, uh, again, want to appreciate the committee's work on this uh, very challenging subject because from my view, uh, patient access and uh, the heritage market uh, have not really been addressed in the current legalization framework. And uh, I feel like this is a great first step in the direction of addressing both of those needs. Uh, thank you. I'm done. All right, our next request for comment is from Holly Carter. Holly, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Holly, you have been unmuted. Hello, and thank you for all the due diligence on this, these important issues for license holders. Um, I want to be another voice of, of gratitude for looking at the transfer of genetics off of not only nursery licenses, but all cultivation licenses to be shared amongst themselves um, and to remove requirements for duplicative licensing if that is 
um, achieved. One step further would be to recommend language for removing the requirement for distribution in between transfers of entities that are held by the same, or between the same entities on the same property. Um, mm -hmm. That would go very far in supporting um, license holders in full operations. And thank you for all the work on the CEQA. Obviously, we need to <laughs> have that addressed and these seems reasonable. Thank you very much. All right, this is the moderator and that is the end of requests for public comment. Uh, we do have one hand raised, but I think it's from before. I'm happy to unmute them just to check. This is Natasha Sokolo. Would you please thank you, moderator? You're welcome. Natasha, you've been unmuted. Do you have a comment on this agenda item? I actually, I don't know how that happened, um, but I will make a comment since I'm here. So I um, I support the um, the focus on the two separate, on the Prop 64 and the, the MRSA. And so um, CEQA moving forward definitely needs to be addressed better. And I think there's plenty of qualified people uh, um, available to help with that. So I look forward to seeing that um, move forward and come to fruition. Thanks. All right. And just a reminder for people who have raised their hands, if you click the hand icon a second time, that is how you lower it. And uh, would you like me to go ahead and close the Q&A panel, Mr. Chair? Please do. Okay, it's closed. So unless we have any additional hand raises from our committee members, which I see none, uh, can we call the roll on the recommendation and second that we received from this committee? Yes, the recommendation received from the license type subcommittee was to recommend that the license authority consider uncoupling the project specific CEQA analysis from annual licenses and instead provide guidance to the local jurisdictions to ensure that applicants meet CEQA compliance during the local permitting process. Uh, Avis Baboyan? Aye. Tim Cermak? Aye. Matt Clifford? Jeff Farrow? I will say aye. Kristen Heidelbach? Aye. Eric Harada? Aye. Kristen Lynch? Aye. Kristen Nevado? Aye. Keith Stevenson? Member Stevenson? You're unmuted. Tamar Todd? Aye. Helena Williams? Aye. David Woolsey? Aye. Ben Wu? Aye. Beverly Yu? Member Stevenson, you're still unmuted. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Very good. Um, Subcommittee uh, Chair Nevidal, do you have anything else before we move on? Yeah, just um, thank you for that, Chair Farrow. I, I would like to um, recap the conversation a bit about number of licenses by type. Um, so um, just a, a brief recap, there was no recommendation that was brought forward. Um, however, we did have and did receive materials from licensing authorities for this item that um, outlined the um, number of provisional licenses by type versus the number of annual licenses issued by type. Um, and that conversation really led us to have a very robust discussion um, and public comment about the provisional licensing program. Um, we anticipated being able to make a motion about the provisional licensing program, however, um, legal as we came back from public comment, initial public comment, um, and prepared a motion about the provisional licensing program, um, directed us that we needed to um, focus on number of licenses by type, such as caps and or floors. 
Um, the committee, the subcommittee members at that time were not prepared to have a discussion about license capping, um, nor were we prepared to have a discussion about the floors of licenses, right? So a minimum number per se. Um, and so we closed the item without really moving much more forward, but I just want to acknowledge that there was broad support from the subcommittee members to um, have a second subcommittee on license types meeting um, and that provisional licensing um, is a priority for the subcommittee members for discussion, um, especially as we are um, moving towards um, that program expiring. We have about 82% of our supply chain is operating under provisional licenses. Furthermore, um, there are zero um, laboratory testing facilities that hold annual licenses. So should the program expire on January 1st, 2022, as it is slated to do, um, it could have incredible impacts on the legal licensing supply chain as we have 82% of our supply chain in provisional licenses and zero annual testing licenses. Um, product would not be able to get into the legal supply chain with zero testing licenses so um, or annual testing licenses. So I just wanted to make sure that um, that was brought forward um, before we closed the discussion on the subcommittee on license types. Um, with that, I have no further comments. Thank you. Thank you, subcommittee chair Nevidal. Um, and I'd just like to say, you know, one of the, the public members mentioned or public participants in the discussion mentioned the additional funding for CEQA, you know, and I think that's a really important part because I, I do believe that, you know, whether they're a small city, CEQA is a challenging piece of legislation to maneuver through and hopefully the new consolidated agency will have the ability to provide some type of assistance to those so that way we can expedite and ensure that they are able to do the work necessary to approve these licenses. So with that, um, I'm gonna make a recommendation that we pause here for about 15 minutes to take a break because uh, we're moving through the agenda pretty well and we resume in 15 minutes from now. So uh, moderator, can you please put up the recess time? And it looks like we'll be at uh, 50, 11.50 we'll resume. And with that, thank you very much. We'll see you in at 11.50. Hello, this is uh, Chair Farrow. It's 11.50. Can we verify that our court reporter has returned before opening the meeting? Hello? Hearing nothing. Does anybody say anything? This is the moderator. I see we have court reporter Irene Nakamura on. Uh, let me go ahead and manually unmute her. All right. Great. Uh, Irene, you've been manually unmuted. Hi, yes, I'm here. Court reporter. Very I good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So uh, can we call the meeting back to order? We might need to get a show of hands rather than do a roll. If we can get a show of hands who has returned so we can make sure we have quorum. Thank you, committee member Nevidal, Woolsey, Babulian, Stevenson, Lynch, Yu, Wu, Williams, Harada, thank you. We have a quorum. Uh, could we uh, unmute Dr. Cermak's uh, mic? And I'm here. And, oh, great. Thank you, Dr. Cermak. Okay, well, we have a quorum. Um, so why don't we resume? Be I did thank uh, the subcommittee on licensing for their work, but I do like enforcement. There was work that could continue to be done. So if all committee members, subcommittee members are interested in maintaining their position on that subcommittee. I would like to have that committee stay um, composed the way it is for now. Any objections to that? Oh, I see committee member Todd. 
your hand is raised or are you doing that to notify me that you're here? Oh, thank you. Thanks, committee member Ty. Committee member Wu. Oh, very good. Okay, so seeing none, uh, we're gonna keep that committee as a standing committee until the next time we have some information that will allow them to take work action on the number of, or the license types. And with that, I would, I would also close that by saying, I, I remind everybody, um, you know, when we first met in November of 2017, we were faced with a emergency reg package by a bunch of people who did a very good job trying to anticipate what they were gonna face. And over the last several years, we've made recommendations and there's been modifications made by the agency. I would say that as they move from a bureau and um, the Department of Food and Ag and the Department of Public Health coming into one cannabis department, the Department of uh, Cannabis Control, that they will be able to use all the information that's been provided, whether we've been able to come to an agreement on license types, but they will have all the data necessary hopefully to make a recommendation that we will all be pleased with. Uh, the one thing is, is that we'll have an opportunity to again, make public comment once that occurs. So with that, uh, we have no other committee member reports. I'd like to jump back to uh, a review and approval of the February 17th uh, Canvas Advisory Committee meeting minutes. Uh, do we have any comments from the committee related to the minutes as provided? Committee Member Nevidal. Um, I'll go ahead and make a motion to um, approve the um, committee meeting minutes from February 17, 2021. Do we have a second? I will second that, Member Heidelbach. Thank you, Vice Chair Heidelbach. Um, any other comments before we open it up to public comment? Seeing none, uh, moderator, could you please open up the roll for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have opened up the question and answer panel. So if any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. And we have William Perno who would like to make a comment. William, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, William, you've been unmuted. Hi, thank you. Uh, William Perno, and I'd like to uh, make reference to documents that have referenced, referenced by uh, committee members, such as the BCC factors for discipline, and even for the licensing uh, committee uh, meeting, there was reference to some documents there. And I'd like to ask that those documents be made available to the public as part of open meeting laws, uh, and that that could be done with the same time as the agendas are published or those documents are provided to those uh, committees there. It will help the public be well informed of what type of uh, information is being uh, provided to the committee. And as such, um, I'm just asking that that be done as part of the open seconds. meeting laws. I'm asking that that be done as part of open meeting laws for the state of California. And I would like to thank the uh, Bureau for having these online meetings and for I'm having a, a method for the public to comment on these items. Thank you. Uh, before we move to the next public comment, I'd like to address that if I could for a moment. So during the committee meeting uh, notice, those, those documents were made available to the public that were participating in those issues. And those documents remain on our website available to the public. Um, so they are available to the public uh, and they can go and get the documents that are referenced off of the website. So um, I've raised, you know, lower the concern. They're there for you if you'd wish to um, go to the website, and pull them off. Thank you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Holly Carter. Holly, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Holly, you've been unmuted. Thank you very much and thank you for um, taking public comment on this agenda item as well. As I said in the subcommittee meeting, one of the things that needs to be addressed is 
the agency's interpretation and education. Hi, I'm on... sorry. We're taking oh. public comment on um, the motion to approve the minutes from February 17th. If you would like oh, to make I'm sorry. Comment. Oh, my apologies. Okay, thank you very much. I'll come mm -hmm. back. Thank you. I'm... All right, this is a moderator. I see no further requests for public comment. Mr. Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Please do, and if I can get okay. roll call. Avis Babulian? Aye. Tim Sermat? Aye. Matt Clifford? Chair Farrell? Aye. Vice Chair Heidelberg? Aye. Eric Carrada? Aye. Kristen Lynch? Aye. Kristen Nebadal? Aye. Keith Stevenson? Amar Todd? Aye. Yeah. Helena Williams? Aye. David Woolsey? Aye. Ben Wu? Ben? Aye. Beverly Yu? Aye. Motion passes. Moving right along, uh, I, we're back to the agenda item five that we took because we didn't take things in order. Uh, agenda item I, uh, five is public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, reminding everybody that the committee may not discuss or take action on any of the matters raised during the public comment section that is not included in this agenda except whether to decide to place the matter on a future agenda which could be discussed during item agenda item number six so with that um i'd like to open the role for um, public comment not on the agenda thank you mr chair i have opened up the q a panel if any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference and we have a request from Eddie Franco. So Eddie, I will let you know when you've been unmuted and just a reminder, you'll have one minute. All right, Eddie, you've been unmuted. Thank you, moderator and committee members, Eddie Franco, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Manager with the California Cannabis Industry Association. I uh, mainly want to say that CCIA recommends that licensing authorities develop an immediate pathway uh, for cannabis retail businesses to permanently implement drive-in, drive-through, or curbside pickup sales operations. Um, since the onset of the pandemic, a lot of operators have implemented these sorts of operations for contactless sales to consumers, um, but current law uh, re requires retailers to request permission from the Bureau every 30 days um, to continue being able to do this with us on track to meet that June 15th um, announced deadline to reopen the state. There's concern that this may expire the opportunity to uh, extend these 30 days. So we would like to see contemplation for a recommendation to uh, permanently establish curbside uh, drive through drive in pickup options for consumers, many of whom will still need to remain uh, socially distanced despite the, the June 15th deadline. Also, we'll very briefly just say CCIA is in the throat. And our next request for public comment is from Cheryl Yaffe. Cheryl, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. You'll have a minute with the 30 second warning. Cheryl, you've been unmuted. Hi, my name is Dr. Sherry Yaffe. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. My name is Dr. Sherry Yafai. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, I've noticed a lot of comments and discussion about um, the recreational market and dispensing and controlling the marketplace. But what I have not heard and what I continue to get frustrated with this organization is the lack of protection for patients. Patients still get no protections um, from their jobs, driving children, disabled, the elderly patients. Um, tax rates are at an all time high, and these are no longer being offered to be discounted for patients with medical recommendations. 30 seconds. In fact, we have to now send patients to get medical marijuana ID cards after 20 years of honoring a physician's recommendation and honoring the 
the patient physician um, relationship, we are now disintegrating that with the recreational movement forward. We have completely pushed aside the patient physician relationship and we're allowing bud tenders to do the work of both a pharmacist and a physician. And we really. All right, our next request for public comment is from Wade Lafter. And Wade, you've been unmuted. Uh, thank you. Um, I had uh, two things that I think would be good. Uh, as part of consolidation, I would ask that the committee uh, discuss how to make the system simpler, make it easier. I think it was Member Babulian who referenced in the subcommittee meeting on licensing. The last thing we need is more license types. Let's make things more simple. And <coughs> you could revisit some of the earlier committee uh, meeting minutes on things like the necessity to have a, a mixed light license for light deprivation. The other thing I'd like to bring up is the idea of patient access to the previous callers. Uh, 30 seconds. Um, thank you. Uh, to the previous callers uh, observation, uh, medical access, and by that I mean to access to products that are formulated for medical need uh, is a disaster in the current marketplace. Even if you have the funds, it's very difficult to find good product for patients. And that's what this whole thing was built on and it was here before recreational happened. And it's really still missing in the current legal system. Thank you, I'm waiting. All right, our next request for comment is from Richard Miller. Richard, I'll let you know when you have been unmuted. Richard, you've been unmuted. Thank you, um, Rich Miller here. I would like to thank the advisory committee and all the subcommittees for all their hard work in moving this forward. And in light of the three entities merging together, I haven't brought this up in the past, but we are still missing and having a shortfall with patient access, compassion, and as well as having a voice on this board since we no longer have a patient advocate being heard from this committee. I would like to ask that it be put on the agenda for the next meeting that we could address the members that have left the board and reconsider venting, reconsider venting new members to join the board, especially for patient, for patients' rights and act and advocate. Thank you for your time. I yield back my time. All right, our next request for public comment is from Katie Maple. Katie, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Katie, you've been unmuted. Uh, good afternoon, Katie Maple, uh, Vice President of Government Affairs and Compliance for Perfect Union. Uh, we're a vertically integrated company with uh, 12 re retail locations throughout the state now. Um, and I just really wanna echo the comments of Eddie Franco with CCIA. Um, we now use curbside pickup at every single one of our locations. It is it is a great benefit to our guests. It helps provide safety, and we've not had any issues with it in terms of um, safety of our guests or our employees. And so, just really would like to see this become something that that becomes more permanent. So, thank you. All right. Our next request for public comment is from Paul and Susan Hasbury Titten. And hold on, and I will let you know when you've been unmuted. Paul and Susan, you've been unmuted. Hi, this is Paul, lovingly and legally, and thanks once again for all your hard work. I'd like to suggest that um, we, as the subcommittees move further, that the chairs of the subcommittees be allowed to um, produce their own agendas rather than have one produced for them by the licensing authority. I know that they want advice on certain things, but the, the advisory committee's purpose, I thought, was to maybe inform the licensing authority and and use the um, from their vast experience from the committee and from the public comment and those things may not occur to the licensing agency as they develop their agendas 30 seconds so if you could uh, please allow the chairs to develop their own agendas that would be i think uh, very helpful thank you that's all i got All right, our next request for public comment is from Holly Carter. Holly, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. And Holly, you've been unmuted. 
Thank you very much. And I'll start where I um, accidentally interjected earlier by saying that I'm hoping that all agencies as they are consolidated have a high um, a degree of training and education amongst each other, amongst the different departments and with industry. We are still finding that the businesses have a lack of information. A lot of um, underground regulations are applied and expectations are put on businesses without any ability for pre-planning or meeting compliance expectations um, when there's things that are still unclear even amongst different staff in one department in one agency. 30 seconds. Um, I'll also echo the, um, the wonderful comments that are made by other people and uh, add my voice of support to those as well. But that's my main concern at this time. So thank you for that. All right, our next request for comment is from Judy uh, Strain or Judith Strain. Judith, you've been unmuted. Good afternoon. I, Judy Strang here, I work with a parent advocacy group who has over the last five years been increasingly concerned about concentrates that find themselves either in candies or snack foods or drinks and of course in bake pans. And we are concerned that we have noticed the increasing concentration that are available. And with that int growing interest by the youth market. And we'd like to have a report from the county, I'm sorry, from the state California Department of Public 30 Health seconds. Re regarding youth access and the role that it is playing in increasing mental health problems with our young. Thank you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Hannah Wilson. Hannah, I'll let you know when you have been unmuted. And Hannah, you've been unmuted. Yes, hi, this is Hannah Nelson, advisor to the Origins Council. Thank you for the comments. Uh, we, I. I want to say that a lot of the difficulties of the intersection between CEQA and cannabis licensing stems from the fact that cannabis is determined to be a project for purposes of CEQA instead of as defined as an agricultural crop, which would then follow traditional land use models. So that is something to consider and to bear in mind as recommendations come forward. Additionally, I'd like to specifically ask that the com committee um, 30 seconds recommend with respect to consolidation that expert stakeholder and agency working group be appointed similar to the successful california appalachians program working group that was employed stakeholder and organizational uh, environmental organization and other stakeholder input as well as interagency input is absolutely necessary in the consolidation process. Thank you very much. Our next request for public comment is from Sarah Armstrong. And Sarah, you've been unmuted. Sarah Armstrong speaking in her capacity as Director of Industry Affairs for Americans for Safe Access. I hope that you won't let go of the enforcement <clears throat> issue and that instead the full committee will determine that input from experts is needed. I'm in the process of drafting a letter that will talk about some of my heroes in terms of enforcement and what they've done. And it is my hope that the full committee will have a series of uh, presentations by both law enforcement working on this situation and um, industry stakeholders. Uh, There's a problem for ASA because patients frequently have compromise, compromised immune systems, and if they ingest contaminated products, they will uh, be fatally or at least terribly inconvenienced by that process. So we would like you to keep going with your enforcement efforts to educate yourself and make the best recommendations possible. Thank you. Our next request for public comment is from Kelly McCormick. Kelly, we'll let you know when you've been unmuted. And Kelly, you've been unmuted. Hi, thank you. I realize that my comment is for the next agenda item, not this one, so I would like to speak then. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. We'll go on to uh, William Perno. William, we'll let you know when you've been unmuted. And, and William, you've been unmuted. Thank you, William Perno. And I'd just like to make a note for the uh, committee to look into Delta 8 THC uh, coming from um, hemp and CBD products there. And that is outside of the regulated market. And those products, while I know they fall under the jurisdiction of the California Department of Public Health, we are seeing people um, advertising for sale in unlicensed places or just regular businesses, products for smoking, vaping, and ingestation, and all those are prohibited by California Department of Public Health. But I see this as um, Delta 8 THC is becoming a real issue because it doesn't fall under the regulated side of cannabis there. So there may need to be some type of um, request for some state legislation to address that in California as is being 30 done. seconds as is being done in other states. And then there's another product, Delta 10 THC, coming from the cannabis plant. Um, but again, it's just one of those areas where uh, those sales for Delta 8 THC products are picking up significantly. And I fear that there could be another unregulated marketplace there uh, being sold for consumption uh, where it shouldn't be under California Department of Public Health. Thank you. All right, and we do have a request from Kelly McCormick. I thought she wanted to comment on a different agenda item, but a second request has been submitted, so I'm just checking back with her. And uh, Kelly, you've been unmuted. Oh, hi, thank you. I was actually, <laughs> I had said that I was gonna speak up the next item in the Q&A, but I will, uh, I heard the comment of the previous gentleman and I definitely support more regulations around the Delta 8 um, because we are seeing that more and more and it's completely unregulated. And so I definitely would like to see more attention paid to that. Thank you. All right, our next request for public comment is from Thomas Caristo and Thomas, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. Thomas, you've been unmuted. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Uh, again, I would just like to echo the uh, dangers of an unregulated Delta 8 or Delta 10 market. Um, coming from a science background, um, the uh, chemical conversions used to get there could introduce, um, you know, dangerous solvents or halogenated cannabinoids. So um, I believe it needs um, more research and uh, would need to be addressed. Thank you for your time. All right, this is a moderator and I see no further requests in the Q&A for comment and I'm looking, I don't see any raised hands. So uh, Mr. Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Please do and while we're contemplating moving on to the next item, just know that the Farm Act didn't approve Delta 8 in any way, shape or form from hemp derived products. And if uh, there is no regulation permitting it in the state, then it is illegal and a non-permitted product. So. We don't have to talk about more regulations. There are none right now for them. And so any sales of those are not permitted under the state of California or any other state unless they've passed regulations permitting it. So with that, I'll move on to agenda item number six for items uh, to discuss on future agenda items and possible Excuse me. I'm getting. And then creating next agenda. Um, meeting minutes or, or uh, agenda for the next meeting. With that, uh, committee members, do you have any suggestions for us for the next agenda or items that we should focus in the next agenda? Committee member Nevidal, your hand is raised. Yeah, hello, this is committee member Nevidal. Um, I'm just kind of, I'm mostly curious about um, when we can expect our next meeting to be. Um, and really um, my question um, is, you know, in looking at that timing, will we be likely um, after the state budget passes, before the state budget passes and just, trying to kind of figure out how we 
um, might coincide with the timing of consolidation. Well, I do. I, this isn't a question and answer period, but I do believe that if we follow our normal meeting uh, periods, even though we want to start early, we will be in the early part of the third quarter, which should, unless barring any uh, hiccups with the consolidation of the agencies, there will be a consolidated agency. I do know that we had extended an invitation to the new uh, director, um, or excuse me, um, why am I saying secretary to address us uh, earlier and that uh, she was waiting until the consolidation occurred. So I would imagine that we will have a meeting that will include the secretary addressing us and talking about her vision for the for the um, department. So um, we are going to keep moving with that agenda in mind. And um, so that's why we're looking for recommendations as we move forward. Uh, thank you for that. I, I do really appreciate that. And um, knowing that we'll be into consolidation likely at that point, um, that would be my recommendation. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that we'll be receiving a presentation from, from the Secretary of the Business Consumer Services Housing Agency. Thank you. This is committee member Cermak. Are you able to hear me? Yes, committee member Cermak, recognized. Your mic is open, committee member Cermak. I'm sorry. I need confirmation that it's open. It's open. We hear you loud and clear. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, two things. One is, um, I really think that we need to um, respect the, the patience and the endurance of uh, those people who have been talking about uh, legacy issues and who are wanting to move into whether or not it's a new type of license or whatever. Uh, I have serious concerns personally about what that would mean, but I think uh, we as a, uh, as a uh, advisory committee really need to find a way of grappling with that as quickly as possible so that they can know what the future is going to hold in terms of what our recommendations are. Um, the second thing is um, I, th I, I think there's a need for a, uh, a public health uh, committee to uh, subcommittee to be convened uh, relatively soon so that we can uh, a look at uh, how the public health issues are going to be uh, dealt with within the consolidated um, regulatory structure. You know, who's going to be doing that? Uh, we need to get clarity on that. Uh, we need, um, we've been waiting for a report from uh, the, the Department of Public Health regarding any progress they're making pursuing um working with the uh university of california around uh a review of the literature about high potency uh, thc products what the risk and benefits of those could be um it, it will be in a situation where once there's a consolidation then i'm not sure that the department of public health is going to be involved anymore in in or in what way they will regarding that um, so uh, we need some update in terms of the progress of that. But more than anything, I think that the uh, subcommittee needs to have as its agenda item, the creation of its agenda, what we believe are the issues for public health that need to be studied, that need to be um, looked at in terms of improvement of regulations. And the committee itself needs to sit down with the public, uh, as participation and look at what are the range of issues that now face us um, for regarding uh, youth and public health issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cermak, for your comments. Uh, any other committee members with comment? Suggestions? 
Uh, well, let's open it up to public comment on agenda items for future meetings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a moderator and I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to talk on this or make a comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen. We are displaying instructions for your reference. All right, we have Eddie Franco that would like to make a comment. So Eddie, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. All right, Eddie, you've been unmuted. Thank you so much, moderator. Eddie Franco, uh, Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Manager with CCIA. Um, just a few suggested agenda items for future meetings. First and foremost, would definitely like to see an agenda item on provisional licensure and a pathway forward, a specific a discussion to that on the next meeting. Um, moreover, We'd love to see a discussion item around um, consumption lounges or even more wider, just the events license type in general, um, looking at that and potential changes and modifications that could be made there. Um, also, and, and um, Chair Farrow, I, I do remember you mentioned this, but um, would love to see um, an agenda, a specific agenda item around social equity um, in the cannabis space. Uh, finally, of course, echo the support to what sounds like is already going to happen, um, a spotlight on consolidation and expected regulatory changes there. Uh, thanks to everybody for a great meeting today. All right, our next request for public comment is from William Perno and William, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. William, you've been unmuted. Thank you, William Perno speaking and I'd like to um, echo and support committee member, member CIRMAC's um, request for um, a public health uh, subcommittee and also for the committee chairs to be able to set their own agendas with input from the Bureau or the consolidated agency, but they really should be able to set their own agenda there with input. I'd also like to ask that there be a future agenda item to address uh, youth access to marijuana. The importance of this is noted in Prop 64 and the Cole Memo, but we know nothing about any uh, minor decoy operations that, that have been done by the Bureau since uh, recreational sales began on January 1st, uh, 2018. We don't know the number of operations done, whether they were done solely by themselves or with local jurisdictions. The results how many operations and the compliance rates for the regulated market and the unlicensed market. Other states are doing hundreds of these operations per year. What is our state doing? The public has a right to know. Thank you. Our next request is from Paul and Susan. And Paul and Susan, you've been unmuted. Hi, yes, this is Paul Hansbury, lovingly and legally. Thank you again. Um, I think that rather than a subcommittee where the public comment is limited to a minute or possibly three, that a working group or, or some sort of committee to address the regulations and perhaps question their interpretation of the statute. Um, not necessarily legislative changes, but interpretations such as uh, agricultural product as opposed to crop. Um, a product is something that's sold and perhaps uh, 64 was written in terms of selling to the public as a cultivation, um, contiguous and the definitions for that as it relates to the industry, micro business and the, the way that that was interpreted by the Bureau. I think that perhaps that they, we might, because it's a very complicated subject that a working group or a committee might be established to explore these interpretations and see if they can't be corrected to make things more available to the applicants. Thank you. All right, our next request for comment is from Kelly McCormick. And Kelly, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. Kelly, you've been unmuted. Thank you, this is Kelly McCormick, and I would like to uh, add a few things for the future agenda items. One is to support the idea of a public health subcommittee or working group. Um, one that would also include an in-depth studies on THC potency and its effect on youth and the brain. I would support minor decoy operations and ask that they include information open to the public about the number of decoy operations, um, compliance rate, and whether it was regulated or unregulated businesses. And I also want to express support for um, 
child-proof packaging on edibles. CNN recently did a report on the increased number of visits to emergency departments, which we have seen in my San Diego area as well. Um, and a lot of that is because of young children that consume edibles not knowing what they are. And of course, you know, edibles contain very high amounts of concentrated THC. So please do more to educate people and to make child-proof packaging and single serve packaging. All right, our next request for public comment is from Wade Lafter. And Wade, you've been unmuted. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to add to the conversation the idea that uh, education is uh, going to be crucial to the system going forward. And I don't know that it really fits into the purview of this committee, but um, I think the regulators and the industry and the public all need to be better educated about how this system is set up currently and what it might look like going forward. Um, I thought the suggestion of a working group, not unlike the uh, Appalachians of Origin working group, uh, to address the consolidation issue is a really good seconds. suggestion. And uh, the last piece I have to throw it in again, um, it's patient access to products that are formulated for those who are seeking benefit from cannabis. And uh, I wanna speak in, favor, in support of Dr. Cermak's uh, public health uh, request, uh, but, it but it should also focus on the benefit as well as the potential challenges or health risks. There are so many benefits compared to the risks. Thank you. All right, this is the moderator, and I see no further requests for public comment in the Q&A panel. Mr. Chair, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. It's closed. Well, those are some good comments. I'll take those into advisement as we make the next agenda meeting and work with the uh, agency to find dates that will allow us both to have our subcommittee meetings and our um, schedule our full committee meeting. Uh, before we call it a day, I'm going to ask uh, our committee if there was anything they wanted to add to future agenda items that they didn't have a chance to discuss last. Committee member Babulian. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd like to echo the request for a discussion on the provisional licenses as well as the delivery license. Thank you very much, Committee Member Bohorian. Seeing no other hands raised at this time, uh, thank you everybody for your participation today. Uh, it was very robust. Uh, we had some great subcommittee work that was done, and I'm happy that uh, the recommendations that were made were all passed. And let's see what happens between now and the next meeting with the consolidation. Uh, we'll be, I'm sure, discussing at the next meeting some of the emergency reg packets that will come out. I can't assume that for sure, but maybe. Um, but uh, if not, we will um, continue with our program uh, with the community until we're no longer needed. So thank you. All right. Have a great day. Be safe. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.